show your support, like, share and subscribe. Hello, I am That British Guy and welcome back to the Raw After. Yes, we are the Raw After again in this video. And in this video, we are looking at the Raw After Payback 2014. We have Michael Cole, Jerry the King Lawler and JBL on commentary. And immediately we get a quick recap of the main event of Payback 2014. The three on three elimination match between Evolution and The Shield. In which The Shield had a complete clean sweep against Evolution. Pinning Batista, Randy Orton and then Triple H. And Evolution come out to the ring with a very very cheesed off Triple H. Basically explaining how... It, come the end, he won't be the loser. He doesn't lose. And his goal is to make sure that the S.H.I.E.L.D. no longer exist. Not just to beat them, but for them to no longer exist. Foreshadowing, people. This goes on far too long, and the crowd gets a bit restless, and we get CM Punk chants. I'm not entirely sure where the show was, but I'm pretty sure at this point in their kind of timeline, the CM Punk chant was just a thing that happened when people were annoyed. So, surprise, surprise. Triple H basically sets up that there's going to be Evolution and The Shield again tonight, and they're going to end it. And Batista kind of takes umbrage with this and demands his one-on-one -on -one title match that he was promised from winning the Royal Rumble. Obviously, at WrestleMania 30, it ended up being a triple threat match when it should have just been him versus Randy Orton. So he's rather annoyed at that. And he should have his one-on-one -on -one title match. Obviously, at this point... Daniel Bryan wasn't competing and wasn't actually at payback at all. I don't believe he certainly didn't compete anyway. And Triple H says, look, we've got this shield stuff to sort out first. Once that's done, no problem. You'll, you'll get your one-on-one -on -one match. I can't give it to you at the moment because he's injured. But if you did get it, you'd probably end up choking anyway. And this is where Batista quits. He understands exactly what Triple H is saying and he walks out and that's where we get the whole gif from. That comes from there. After demanding Batista to come back into the ring, Triple H just basically says, well, don't come crawling back to me when your career in movies fails. Works out quite well in the end, didn't it? <laughs> At Payback, we had two title matches. Sheamus, the United States champion, successfully defending against Cesaro. And Wade Barrett, the Intercontinental champion, successfully defending against Rob Van Dam. So on this episode, we get kind of a rematch in tag form. We get Sheamus and RVD on one side, facing off against Cesaro and Wade Barrett on the other side. And Cesaro, at this point, was aligned with Paul Heyman. And Paul Heyman was kind of sitting at the commentary desk, rather than being directly ringside. And spends the majority of his time talking about how he is the one behind 21 and 1. Just referring back to Brock Lesnar at every single opportunity. So it was clear that although they'd aligned Cesaro with Paul Heyman, Cesaro was not the important thing here. It was just a case of keeping the Brock Lesnar thing bubbling about in people's minds before he then comes back. What is interesting though is the kind of middle portion of the match is mainly Cesaro with a bit of Wade Barrett kind of working over Rob Van Dam until he manages to get the hot tag back into Cesaro. Uh. It looks like Cesaro is kind of going to succumb to the face team. But Paul Heyman pulls him out of the ring and they just kind of walk off, leaving Wade Barrett high and dry. He then eats a brogue kick and a five-star frog splash and loses. The only problem with this, I was going to say way to make your champion look strong, but you had a champion on either side, so you were kind of screwed right from the start. You know how most of the time we get Elias coming out now and doing a quick your hometown sucks moment especially in song well back in 2014 that was damien sandow's job 
He came out in basketball jersey as Lance Stevenson and did some basketball things and said something about LeBron James as well. There was a basket in the kind of corner and he did some really bad skills. Basically it led to Big Show coming out, punching him in the face and dunking the ball in the hoop. Cool. That was pointless. Moving on. At Payback, we were meant to see Kofi Kingston versus Bo Dallas in what would have been Bo Dallas's first pay-per-view match. But the match was effectively a write-off thanks to Kane. I think he came down and attacked Kofi and Bo kind of disappeared. So we have the match now. Kofi Kingston, who now in 2019, five years later, is the WWE Champion, is facing off against the undefeated so far, Bo Dallas. Oh, how times have changed. <laughs> Bo Dallas has not been on the main roster too long. He's doing his Bo Leave thing, which JBL absolutely loves. And he is referred to at the time as the longest ever reigning NXT champion. Pretty sure he's not anymore. Don't quote me on that, but I don't think he is. And it's very easy to forget that he even ever was NXT champion. Because he's certainly not held in as high regard as even past champions such as Big E. Or certainly not Seth Rollins, obviously. He is kind of now on a par of Bobby Roode level of NXT champion, which is ridiculous because when Bobby Roode was NXT champion, he was much better at the NXT champion side really than Bo was because, well, the NXT brand was bigger. Anyway, funny how things change is basically all I'm saying. This match is, again, really just a showpiece for Bo Dallas. Kofi does get some kind of high-flying hope spots in towards the end. But Bo Dallas does win with the running Bo Dog, but it's really oddly executed, and he is still undefeated. I think only 4 and O or 4 and Bo, as JBL puts it, but undefeated nevertheless against the now WWE Champion. We then get a quick recap of what happened at the beginning of the show with Evolution. But we also see this kind of exclusive thing that's on the WWE app. It's not that exclusive if you're now showing it on Raw. Of Batista being interviewed backstage afterwards. And he basically says that he's promised all this stuff. And it's all been a bunch of crap. And he's had enough. And he's done. And he just walks off into the distance. This leads into Renee Young trying to get an interview with Triple H just to kind of get his mindset and see what's happening with Evolution going forward. But she is kind of met with Stephanie McMahon who announces that forget about that whole Evolution Shield stuff. I've got a bigger announcement so come with me to the ring. Earlier in the night we saw the sort of fallout from the Stephanie McMahon and Brie Bella confrontation at Payback. Basically, Stephanie McMahon was sort of forcing Daniel Bryan's hand, making him relinquish the World Heavyweight Championships in order to kind of save Bree's job. Otherwise, Stephanie was going to fire Bree. So Bree sort of protects Bryan by quitting there and then. So Stephanie is kind of on this mission. You've got Triple H with the Evolution and Shield stuff as one focus and Stephanie on a kind of the warpath against Daniel Bryan because he shouldn't be the champion he wasn't meant to kind of win at Wrestlemania um, and now because he is injured she is on a mission to kind of strip him of the title because he's not a fighting champion and he's not worthy of it and she announces that if he is not fit and ready for money in the bank then he will be stripped of the belts and they will be the prize for the Money in the Bank ladder match. However, if he is fit and ready, he will be facing off against Kane in a stretcher match and the Money in the Bank ladder match will just be a conventional match for the briefcase, which, as we know, did lead to a Seth Rollins win, which led to a Seth Rollins cash-in at WrestleMania 31, and we kind of know what happened around that. 
but she is interrupted as she's kind of explaining all this. She does get the details out, but as she's going on a tirade, John Cena comes out, and this was very much in the midst still of the John Cena sucks moment, but he is very much kind of embracing that, doesn't really care, he's just pleased to be there and get a reaction, and he is putting over Daniel Bryan huge here, giving the full Cena endorsement, and sort of saying that, Stephanie, you need to kind of get past your personal issues with him. He is your champion. He is a very, very good champion. He's a very good representative for the company. Stop letting your personal feelings get in the way. And kind of putting over this idea of, I was happy to relinquish the title when I was injured because I knew it wouldn't take me long to get an opportunity to get the title back because I'd had so many times with the belt. But... Daniel Bryan keeps getting cut off at the knees every single time he is a champion. You basically remove that from him, starting all the way back at SummerSlam the previous year when Daniel Bryan actually beat John Cena. So, of course, he's a bit more resistant to give the belts up because the chances are you're not going to let him anywhere near the belt ever again. And this leads to Stephanie kind of calling out Kane and setting up a match between Kane and John Cena right there and then basically to teach John Cena a lesson, because, ooh, it's the Demon Kane, woo! It's a pretty know-nothing match, it's just a match to show how strong Kane is, although probably shouldn't have been in 2014, certainly shouldn't be in 2018, 2019. The one thing of note is a nice-looking drop kick from John Cena, you don't see that every day. This then kind of leads into the old five moves of doom, John Cena comeback. Kane cuts this off and ignores the referee's five count and gets disqualified. Seems a bit weird. You're trying to build Kane up for this potential title match. Just have him beat Cena. Why not? <laughs> Must keep Cena looking strong for reasons. We then get the same evolution recap that we got earlier from what happened at the beginning of the show. This then leads into a very brief interview with Randy Orton, calling out Roman Reigns, setting up our main event for the night, Randy Orton versus Roman Reigns. On the payback pre-show thing the night before, El Torito beat Hornswoggle in a hair versus mask match. So Hornswoggle has a half-shaven head. Tonight, he is accompanying 3MB as they face off against Los Matadores. And this is basically the finish of the entire match, basically. His wig gets removed. That causes a distraction. Los Matadores win. Cool. Moving on. Because Brie Bella has quit, Nikki Bella now doesn't have the kind of backup. There's no more Bella twins. She is facing off against Alicia Fox and Aksana. Yes, remember her? Well, here's a very pointless match. Nikki manages to pretty much overpower Oksana, who then forces the tag to Alicia Fox. Alicia Fox wins. Cool, thanks for that. Moving on. We then get a kind of creepy Wyatt-esque promo. You know, the kind of old school ones. The ones that actually did sort of mean something. But what is interesting here is there is no Bray Wyatt. It is just... Luke Harper and Eric Rowan. There is the rocking chair and that is completely empty and they basically say that they are going to take up his fight for him. Bray White did lose the previous night, surprisingly, to John Cena and kind of has disappeared briefly. Harper and Rowan have got a match against the Usos who are the tag champions with those god-awful horrible bronze coin things and they were essentially John Cena's backup the previous night. Jack Swagger is in the ring with Zeb Coulter. Zeb Coulter does his whole we need to deport the Romans from the country because America and is focusing this on Jack Swagger's opponent Adam Rose. I thought Adam Rose was American. If he isn't I'm not really sure where he is from. If he is American, where the hell are you going to deport him to? 
okay. And yeah, Adam Rose comes down with all the rose buds. And JBL hates all of them, especially the stupid bunny and the lemon drop thing. Again, this is a kind of know-nothing match. This whole middle portion of the show is just meh. Adam Rose initially gets some kind of slaps to Jack Swagger's bum in at the beginning. Pretty early on we get some more CM Punk chants because the crowd doesn't care about this match either. Because of course they don't. But towards the end, we get Adam Rose hit the double knees. Not as good as Andrade does it, I might add. And then he hits this kind of weird face buster for the win. Cool. Moving on. Byron Saxton has a short interview with the Usos. And this was the face paint version of the Usos. But they were less kind of white meat baby face Usos here. They were kind of prototype what they became in 2017-18 with the Usos penitentiary stuff and kind of what they are now but not quite as much they've got that level of intensity or at least they've shown glimpses of it and they just basically respond to Harper and Rowan and will be facing them later on in the night and I say later on in the night I actually mean next this is a very, very good match. It's a very good showcase for Luke Harper especially, but Eric Rowan as well. And it is just such a shame watching matches like this to see that Vince McMahon has absolutely no intention of using Luke Harper for anything at all. What a shame. There is no Bray Wyatt. His chair is out there, but it is completely empty. And it is down to Harper and Rowan to kind of rebuild the Wyatt family and uh, goal essentially this was long before we saw any Braun Strowman so it's just these two guys against the Usos and any chance the Usos get to kind of get back up on top they get swatted down immediately what is interesting is commentary keep putting over Harper and Rowan as potential threats to the tag titles and obviously if they win here, that will pretty much set them up to be number one contenders. Obviously the hot tag brings the Usos back into the match. And this is kind of thwarted by a very nice looking dive by Luke Harper. Rowan even hits this kind of side slam move, which is fairly similar to his weird kind of claw slam thing that he does now. But yes, it's effectively exactly what you would expect from high-flying Usos versus kind of bigger, stronger Wyatt family members. A very kind of nice bigger guys versus smaller guys match, strength versus speed and agility, is easily the best match of the show. And Harper and Rowan win without any help from, obviously, Bray Wyatt because he's not there. And as I said before, no Braun Strowman either. It's about a year before Braun Strowman makes any kind of appearance. Interestingly enough, they don't actually go on to win the tag belts. I'm not even sure they get shot at them, but if they do, they certainly don't win them because the Wyatt family don't win any tag gold until after the brand split when Randy Orton joins the Wyatt family. That was their kind of first taste of gold as the Wyatt family, which was three years away. Next up we get a Money in the Bank qualifying match. Always nice to see these. I wish we would have kind of seen a bit more of that this year rather than just these guys are going to be in the match and these people are going to be in the match. No, let's have some qualifiers. Make it actually mean something. And here we have two past winners of the briefcase and two successful cash-ins of those briefcases as well. Dolph Ziggler versus Alberto Del Rio. They refer back to, obviously, Stephanie's announcement earlier that not only could this be for the briefcase for the opportunity for the belt, this could actually be to get in the ladder match to win the belt, depending on Daniel Bryan's health. There's not really too much to comment on in the match. Most notably is Del Rio kind of working Ziggler's arm towards the start of the match, and then Ziggler doesn't really sell the arm throughout the match, and then the cross arm breaker goes on at the end and he taps out fairly quickly it's very kind of disjointed storytelling within the match to kind of lead to that 
finish. We get yet another payback kind of recap, focusing in on Goldust and Cody Rhodes. Now this was before he became Stardust. And they are partnering up at the moment and basically Cody is kind of the one that keeps costing the team. And he has decided that it's not fair for him to be holding gold dust back. So he is going to find partners for him in the future instead of ruining gold dust chances. So he teams gold dust up with Sin Cara. This is Sin Cara 2.0. And they are facing off against Ryabaxel. Bet you forgot they were a team. Ryback and Curtis Axel. Or Michael McGillicutty and Skip Sheffield. Whenever Ryback is in the ring, we just get Goldberg chants. Because of course we do. And it is just basically a Ryabaxel showcase for whatever reason. Thus leading to them getting the pinfall victory over Sin Cara protecting Goldust a little bit. We see Cody looking on from backstage, becoming more and more concerned, and it is basically his fault that the team lost because he picked a bad partner for Goldust, even though he wasn't even at ringside to influence the match in any possible way. But it's still his fault. Okay. Weird, but sure. Next up, we get a presentation for Rusev. And as Lana is introducing what a hero he is and how horrible America are, we get a nice little Edward Snowden reference. And this is essentially just foreign heel stuff. He is a foreigner. Boo him. He's a hero in his country. Therefore, he must be bad in America because the foreign guy. They explain this as he's getting this award for his actions at Payback, which is loosely linked into an attack on Big E. We don't actually see anything, though. It's one of those moments where we actually could have done with a bit of a recap of what happened at Payback, but we don't get anything. But in the ring, we get all the pomp and circumstance and the flags, and he gets this medal, and there's pseudo-Russian guys in there, and we get the national anthem. And just as you think, oh, this must be leading to somebody coming out and starting a feud with him and beating him up for being a foreigner and USA and all that. No, it just carries on, carries on, carries on and finishes. Weird. And finally, we have our main event. Randy Orton versus Roman Reigns. Or do we? Firstly, the Shield come out through the crowd into the ring and cut a short promo. First, Dean Ambrose, who pretty much leads most of it, and then Seth and Roman afterwards. And they explain their clean sweep and how they're dominant and that they're a brotherhood and that, yeah, that's kind of, they are the strongest bond within WWE. Out comes Randy Orton, accompanied with Triple H, who has himself... A sledgehammer and seeing this Seth Rollins darts out to get a couple of chairs presumably to kind of counter the whole sledgehammer thing and he leaves one in the corner rather than give it to Dean or Roman I can understand him only getting one because obviously Roman's about to compete so one chair for him one chair for Dean but he doesn't actually ever give the chair to Dean or put it anywhere near him it's just sort of there and then he keeps his one where he is. We get a bit of a kind of a face off between them and Triple H explaining that last night was plan A but he's got plan B in mind right now. Dean and Roman do their little step forward to kind of be like yeah come on then bring it on leaving Seth behind which I think is a cleverer way of setting it than Seth actually stepping backwards because then it looks like he's about to do something. And then, obviously, we get the chair shot heard around the world to our Roman Reigns. And then the look from Dean Ambrose. Then the attack on him, wallop, 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 wallop from Seth to really specifically Dean Ambrose. And then when Orton comes into the ring, he focuses his attack on Roman Reigns. So we get two kind of distinct... Uh, ways forward which is the way they pretty much go we get Rollins and Ambrose in a feud together 
and then we get kind of Orton and then the authority and that kind of side of things against Roman Reigns effectively trying to kind of single out Roman Reigns as the main guy going forward the main kind of hero and then they beat that drum to death for years and years and years and years and that is where we end the show with Triple H Randy Orton and Seth Rollins standing victorious the shield are no more they have been utterly destroyed until they bring them back and then until Dean Ambrose leaves so really the thing that actually did make sure that the shield exists no more is actually AEW Triple H so you did lose and all you kept getting from him they were just about picking it up on camera was him just saying I win again and again and kind of smirking at what he had created so that was the Raw After Payback 2014 only really two things of note one the kind of top and tail of the show Batista quitting and the shield ending we kind of knew that was coming anyway a lot of kind of feeding into what happened at payback but most of those feuds were seen as very inconsequential really a little bit with the whole Daniel Bryan thing but because he wasn't on the show it was kind of janky and disjointed especially using kind of Kane and Cena as proxies for that. It was a bit weird. A very, very good match between the Usos and Luke Harper and Eric Rowan, which is worth a watch. And a horrible section in the middle with pointless matches that nobody cared about. And then some CM Punk chants, so woohoo. Next month, we will be looking at the Raw After Money in the Bank 2011. You know, when CM Punk was actually in the company, so CM Punk chance actually made sense. He wins the belt and leaves forever. So let's see what happens on the Raw after he leaves the company with the main belt. But until next time, I have been that British guy and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.